Five Live Formula One. Welcome to the Check and Flag podcast, post qualifying podcast. But we didn't actually get uh, qualifying, not on the Saturday, at least. Uh, alongside myself, Harry Benjamin is the former Renault Formula One driver, Jolian Palmer, and the BBC's F1 correspondent, Andrew Benson. Jolian, we waited. Then we waited again. We waited a little bit more. But we didn't get a qualifying today. In the end, postponed. I haven't seen that too often in Formula One, but it has happened. Yeah, not for many years. What a shame, because the scene was quite set, wasn't it? A decent sprint race in the dry, qualifying yesterday in the dry. Then it hoses it down. I'm ready for Verstappen versus Norris. They're both good in the wet. Wanted to see who come out on top, but we will have to wait. Well, we waited sort of every 15 minutes for an update, an estimation as to when we were get, going to get running underway. We could see Bert Mylander and the Aston Martin going around on circuit, all the marshals trying to sweep the rain away. And we know rain is something uh, that is fairly common in Interlagos. But is there any other way we could have got this running? Could we have predicted the radar, the, the weather systems that the teams have are way more advanced than what we can find on our phone. Surely we could have maybe predicted this and brought it forward a little sooner to at least maybe get in a, a Q1 and take the grid from there rather than wait and wait and wait and delay it all till Sunday. But that's not how it works. You know, qualifying is at a certain time. It's preset at the start of the year, pretty much your, your race timings are. So we, we wait for that. And so qualifying came, sadly, about 40 minutes before the rain chucked it down. If we'd have started an hour before, we would have had a Q1, but sometimes it's, you, you have the rain hit, then it dries up. It's actually pretty rare to have a Sunday morning qualifying and often you wait and you get a more entertaining result. And maybe it will be the case tomorrow still, but with the amount of rain that came down, it's really gloomy as well. So the visibility is tough. With the spray as well, it would have been impossible. It really hangs in the air. And from experience... This is just such a difficult circuit in the rain. The run up from the final corner up through turns 13, 14, 15, flat out left-handers, they're not flat out in the wet. They're perilous. You get aquaplaning so easily. And I mean, I, I drove it in the wet race. The amount of cars that ended in the wall there, even I remember Romain Grosjean crashing to get to the grid. It's just not the sort of circuit you want to take chances with. Is there also a factor to say here, though, about we all kind of know that the full wet tyre doesn't do the job. If, as we heard an excerpt while we were waiting of Lewis Hamilton sort of gate crashing an interview with Stefano Domenicali, uh, is there an opportunity where if we had a better full wet tyre, maybe there was more of a chance of going out on track? Well, the problem is that a better wet tyre would solve one problem. It would clear the water more effectively. And, um, you know, the drivers for a long time have said that the Pirelli wet tyre, extreme wet tyre, that is, is not good enough, basically. Um, Sebastian Vettel used to refer to it as a safety car tyre, and it was only useful for those conditions. Um, Which is basically true. We never see the full wet tyre, yeah. do we? Because it's got no performance compared to an intermediate. Yeah. And when it's full wet tyre worthy conditions, we don't run problem is that the that only solves one problem the other problem is the visibility and that has become in recent years that's become a thing that the drivers are not prepared to sacrifice anymore um you know time was 20 30 years ago when grand prix took place in atrocious conditions um maybe the wet tires from goodyear michelin and bridgestone at that time were more effective than the pirelli ones are now i'm not sure but um certainly the drivers went out in much worse visibility than they're prepared to go out now and uh it, it's i guess it's, a, it's an inevitability as you know the the um you know, a society's assessment of what's acceptable risk changes. Um, so it wouldn't fix that problem. In fact, it might even make that problem slightly worse because you're dispersing more water from the tyres, even though most of the water spray comes from the underbody of the car. Disp disperse more water by the tyres, you get more spray and therefore even worse, vis even worse visibility. I remember even 2016 racing in Brazil with terrible visibility. We started the race behind the safety car, put the gas on, speed builds, visibility goes to zero. Later on in the race, I hit Daniel Kvyat before I could see him. It was that bad. But at the start of the race, I think I was sitting behind Jensen Button. I had someone else just behind, Carlos Sainz or something. They, everyone just went, went blank. Couldn't see a thing. So you imagine you're driving high speed. It's a long straight with a curve in it. So you're driving like you have a blindfold on, literally. And you're trying to, you're, you're doing 150 miles per hour in a Formula One race. And you're trying to work out where the blooming track goes. And you know it's not straight. 
So you can't just keep your wheel straight. You know you have to turn slightly to the left. Turn too much to the left, you're in the pit wall. Not turn enough, you're in the outside wall. So you're sort of feathering out. You're trying to get any level of visibility to see where the edge of the track is. And I remember making it through on part throttle, trying to work it out. And I'm like in my head thinking, I'm going to be last. This is disastrous. I'm, I just can't go quicker than this. And I hit the brakes for the first corner, just to see the slightest bit of a brake marker board, hit the brakes. And I was coming around the outside of Button. I was like, oh, that was all right, actually, then. Turns out everyone was in the same move. boat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll take that. <laughs> but, you know, we're all in the same boat as drivers. You just have no idea. The flip side is, had Jensen Button been broadside ahead of me, I'd have nailed into him. I could not see a single thing. And you're all in the same boat. It is just the most dangerous conditions you can have. Well, look, safety is always the top priority. And at the time of recording this, a decision on when we will go qualifying on Sunday morning uh, has yet to be decided, but that will be uh, done as soon as possible. So as soon as we know it, and uh, we will try and let you know, keep across the BBC uh, socials on BBC Sport and indeed the BBC Sport website and app. But Andrew, this goes to Sunday morning qualifying if all is well. We are expecting rain though, but right now, let's presume we are able to go qualifying. What's the run of play here? How does it work? We could, we could have a very, very <laughs> long day, Harry, couldn't we? Technically, there has to be four hours minimum between the end of qualifying and the beginning of the race. So the race starts at two o'clock local time or scheduled to, that's five o'clock PM in the UK. So qualifying really has to end by 10 AM in Sao Paulo which is 1 p.m. in the UK. So it really has to start no later than 12 o'clock. So the problem is they're probably going to want to build in a bit of leeway because there is a forecast of rain for tomorrow. So you could have a situation where the start of qualifying is delayed again. You can't have a start of qualifying delay decision immediately negating qualifying and then having to create a grid from we don't know what yet because the rules don't cover that. We've discovered in the last few minutes. So I suspect they'll try and start qualifying a bit before that. But um, by the time people listen to this podcast, probably they'll already know. But that's the process. Well, let's talk about some of the action that we did see on track today and the sprint race, of course, which was won by Lando Norris, Oscar Piastri, eventually playing the team game and letting Norris by. But Jolien Palmer, that really kept us on the edge of our seats for a while, didn't it? And bigger questions will be asked here about the McLaren strategy decisions. It worked out on this occasion, but it was on the edge. Yeah, they sort of came out looking fine with the one-two, with the driver they wanted in front in front. So on paper at the end, actually, it was, it was pretty solid. Uh, but the reality was, it was a much more confusing race than it needed to be for them. And they, they were kind of lucky to get away with the result that they had. The decision to swap the places only came towards the end, and it was hurried because of the VSC at the end for Nico Hülkenberg's stranded Haas. Had that not happened 30 seconds before the VSC was called, we might have had a different result, and they would have looked really silly had they not swapped with Norris continually asking for it. And then Piastri wins the, wins the sprint. So they were, it turns out they were waiting for a bigger gap between uh, Norris and Leclerc. They were, it got to about 1.6 seconds on lap three. And I was watching it and I was thinking, this is the time to do it. Um, that was plenty of time, I think, plenty of margin to, for Piastri to you know, let Norris buy into turn four, for example, or even up the hill into sort of five, six, seven, uh, given his teammates. It's not like it's an overtaking situation, but they didn't take that because they were looking for slightly bigger margin. Um, and that's not the first time this year. The Hungary uh, race switcheroo for Argo was caused by them sort of going uber cautious on um, the offset that they had to Lewis Hamilton. Uh, that's why they called the drivers in in the order that, that they did back in Hungary. Same thing happened here. And the problem was that, it, that 1.6 seconds was as big as that gap got. Leclerc then closed back up on them. And then he came under threat from Verstappen. And then, the, the, you know, the opportunity didn't really arise. And then they it, it, they got to a point where they, they really had to do it or they, or they were in potential trouble because Hülkenberg's Haas was stopped by the side of the track. Everyone could see that there was going to be a virtual safety car or a safety car. And you don't know how long that's going to last at that point. Um, so they would have to have done it, tried to do it before then. 
and we've already heard Red Bull complaining about how long that, well, not complaining, but sort of saying it was annoying, you know, uh, that long gap uh, between Hulkenberg's car stopping and the virtual safety car actually being deployed. McLaren got the switch in, in that gap, but, you know, it was touch and go. It was a really long wait as well. Hulkenberg had his car parked on the side of the track for a very long time. He had his steering wheel off. He was trying to get out of it, but because the car was on a on a slope, it was rolling. But you kind of knew that he wasn't going to go anywhere. That it was smoking as well before he stopped. He had a clear engine issue, and yet yeah, the safety car call was a very long way after. It was over a lap after that the cars all came through with just a yellow flag for for the cars just stranded on the right hand side. So I can kind of see that as soon as the McLaren swap did happen the safety car came out or within 20 seconds of that or so. So I can see the frustration a little bit for Red Bull on that. Had the safety car been deployed immediately, as it turned out, would have been okay because there was a, there was time after it because the car was cleared quickly. But it might have been a trickier situation for McLaren. Well, it might have been. In the end, they ended up with a 1-2 in the sprint. Norris taking the win. Let's hear from the sprint winner. So Lando, you got the win. It sounded a little bit tense on the radio at times. Can we just get your reflections on how the race unfolded and how that was managed from McLaren's perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's always tense when you have two cars just behind you and uh, the Oscar was just ahead, but we managed it well. Um, it's not an easy position to be in, whether or not people say it is. Uh, it's not, and um, I think uh, between Oscar and myself, we handled it well. I could have attacked him a lot more in the beginning, um, but I was confident that uh, things were going to change and we were going to do as we planned. So, um, yeah, always a little risk in doing what we did, but we did um, we did it well and we did what we needed to do. Thanks, Lando. Lando Norris doing what he needs to do and taking the full eight points, crucial in uh, shortening that gap between himself and Max Verstappen. But I'll tell you what, Piastri, though, coming home in second, it was his to win, really, though, Jolien. But actually, this was this was a good start to the weekend for Oscar Piastri because off the back of the last few weekends, he actually hasn't really been on par with Lando Norris because the momentum's been with the Brit and not so much with the Aussie. Yeah, I mean, he did the job in sprint qualifying, didn't he? Put it on pole. Got the start very nicely as well. They kept one, two. Both McLarens got away nicely. I, I think the pace, we, we didn't see a pace comparison between Norris and Piastri, really, because Norris was bunched in behind Piastri for pretty much the whole thing, was a second away. Piastri was asked to help Lando out with the DRS. Could Norris have caught up regardless? He clearly thinks that, uh, that there was a chance to try and pressurise his teammate, but he wasn't interested in having a wheel-to-wheel -wheel scrap with his teammate that he knew would give him the lead later on anyway. So it was a nice position for Piastri and McLaren had obviously told the team that they were going to do team orders. Norris knew, Piastri knew, and, um, and he duly did when he was asked. Well, the irony was that the VSC in the end helped Norris uh, rather than hindered him because it got Verstappen a penalty. Um, he, um, when the race restarted, he was right up behind Oscar Piastri. He'd closed. Uh, he'd been a you know ten twenty meters behind uh, when the v VSC um, was called. You got to maintain that gap, and going into turn four down the back straight, while you could see that the VSC was still on, it was uh, on the TV screens and also the uh, uh, message boards on the side of the track that the drivers can see. Verstappen pulled not not just right up behind Piastri. He came a little bit alongside him, heading into the corner passing a sign that said, you know, VSC lit up. And the stewards noticed that and um, called him in to see them. And he got a five second penalty and that put him down a place back behind Charles Leclerc. So that gave the Norris an extra point, which who knows, that meant, might end up being valuable depending on how things go for the rest of the season. Yeah, it certainly went the way of uh, McLaren in the sprint. Let's hear from second place man Piastri. Oscar leading that one for so long. He played the team game in the end. Can you talk us through the approach to that race and your reflections on it, please? Um, yeah, it was a, a bit of a tricky race, to be honest. Um, just trying to learn what we could for tomorrow. Um, and uh, yeah, I think you know the team result was obviously what we, we wanted and, and what we spoke about before the race. So um, I think it all went to plan and uh, learn a lot for, for tomorrow. Thanks, Oscar. Piastri there speaking after finishing second in the sprint. Uh, let's go down one place. Well, one place on the road, at least, Julian, as Andrew has just said. Max Verstappen finished third on the road, and it was really a brilliant fight for the top four positions throughout the majority of the sprint. Great racing, but 
As Andrew highlighted, that VSC incident for Max Verstappen giving him the five-second time penalty that dropped him behind Leclerc. So again, a crucial point taken away from Verstappen. But is this Verstappen sort of living in the grey areas once again? Although I suppose it wasn't so grey in the end. Yeah, it was pretty much black and white and that's why he got the penalty. So I, I actually thought Max had a good race and he was very encouraged starting fourth, didn't get a great start, but held on to fourth at the first corner. And just had pace. He was putting pressure on Leclerc for a lot of the race. Leclerc was stuck behind Norris. He could defend with the DRS as well. But as soon as Leclerc started dropping back, he felt that Verstappen was going to put the pressure on and eventually pass, which he did with about four laps to go. And then, at the end, had the, the chance to pass Piastri. But this was a mistake from, uh, from Verstappen, who was so eager to clear Piastri and get to within one point of Lando that, um, that he, he basically preempted the end of the VSC, went too quick under safety car conditions, no grey area there. And whilst Verstappen and, and Red Bull tried to uh, tried to sort of claim that there was no advantage gained, there was no advantage gained, but the rules are not grey there. They're black and white, and he got a five-second penalty. Is this a sign that Verstappen is feeling a little bit of the pinch in this title fight? I mean, the gap is still large, but, you know, one point in the sprint that he's dicing for on the line you know re restarting after a vsc they're pretty used to that they know the deltas they've got a hit on on their dash it's a bit clumsy yeah you, you this is not the first sign that verstappen's feeling the pinch well, i don't mean having watched the last two grand prix the signs have been there the continual clearly. pinch squeezes yeah exactly but it, it, it does show you know he he is fighting for every point and whilst we're all looking at it and thinking this a, a gap that size has never been overturned Norris has had far from a perfect season. He's, he's made driving mistakes in there. McLaren have made um, strategy errors fairly often. They've had uh, team orders, dilemmas, which have taken away some, uh, some points as well. They've not put together a chiseled championship run. Verstappen is a long way ahead. We're thinking it's a long shot, but Verstappen's obviously not thinking it's a long shot. He wants every single point he can because he's obviously worried that Norris, with a better car now, is having a good run. But going for that extra point cost him a point in the end. Let's hear from the Dutchman, who finished, in the end, fourth after the penalty. Max, it looked like the car came alive for you in that race, and then until the VSC at the end, can we get your reflections on how that unfolded? Yeah, I think the pace was quite strong. Um, we just have to be patient, because uh, in the beginning we're just stuck in a DRS train, so you can't really do much. You just have to wait for people to either drop off or, or make a mistake and uh, yeah we just hung in there and uh, yeah eventually I could pass uh, Charles and uh, close the gap to the McLarens but then of course unfortunately uh, yeah the VAC came out so that was then uh, race over. Thanks Max. Max Verstappen then who ended up in fourth it was Charles Leclerc who ended up getting promoted onto the final uh, rostrum in third for the sprint Carlos Sainz in the other Ferrari fifth and Julian Leclerc had a really good run right in the dice early doors, but then fell back and finished pretty close to his teammate Sainz, who was never in that fight to begin with in the top four position. So what happened to Ferrari in the sprint? They had, surprisingly, a lack of pace, having had great race pace in the last two Grand Prix. Uh, Sainz was never quick, actually. And whilst the top four were all kind of scrapping a little bit, even kind of by proxy, no massive wheel to wheels, but there was always a bit of tension trying to get within the DRS and trying to apply pressure. He sort of wondered if Science was dropping back to save the tyres and come for a late charge, but he just never had the pace. Leclerc did have the pace early on, was putting pressure on Norris at times, but then seemed to overcook his tyres, and he also fell away late on. So it was uh, a bit of an anomalously poor race from Ferrari, fourth and fifth in the end, and, and quite a distance away from the top three. Well, let's hear from Leclerc then, who got promoted to third after Verstappen's penalty. Charles. Sure. P4 at the end of that, it looked like a mighty battle with Max. Can you talk us through that from your perspective, please? I had no rears at all. I mean, uh, I pushed a lot at the beginning. I think Max was a lot more on the reserve at the beginning and then started pushing at the end and he had more pace. I mean, he did a better job with time management. On my side, I wanted to take risk at the beginning to try and put pressure on the McLaren, but it didn't work out. OK, then that was happening up the sharp end. Um, but there were some good dices a little further down in the points orders. Mercedes, a bit anonymous in the sprint. Hamilton fell back, recovered to 11th, which is where he started. Indeed, Russell didn't make any progress from where he started either, but did back a couple of points in sixth. But they've not really been happy, well, for a couple of weekends now, but didn't start this weekend on the right foot either. 
no, really lacking pace, struggling with compliance in the car. And yeah, head scratcher once again for Mercedes, kind of where they have been. I think they hope to be better this weekend, but I, if, if anything, they seem to be further away. And uh, lastly, perhaps uh, a little shout out for uh, Pierre Gasly with a, uh, a brilliant result in the sprint, managing to uh, get a point away and or a couple of points and actually they close Alpine to within a point of Williams for eighth in the constructors. It's big money for those guys. It, it's not irrelevant. It seems like small fry because there's a championship fight going on for the drivers and the constructors, but actually it's still decent money that's paid out for eighth or ninth. And Gasly's come into a bit of form in the in, in one Alpine anyway to the end of the year. Had a decent run to seventh. I thought also Liam Lawson did pretty well, running in ninth for for um, for RB. Just got uh, done out of the points by Sergio Perez, who also, to be fair, had a decent run, having qualified out in 13th, came through, got eighth, got the fastest lap. And I think that also shows it's not just Verstappen. That Red Bull car was working quite nicely. Both of them had, uh, had solid races. So penalty or not, I think you can expect Red Bull to be coming through on Sunday. Right, well, at least we did get some action to talk about on Saturday then, uh, but we'll wrap things up there then. Thanks, Andrew Benson. Thank you, Jolian Palmer. We will hopefully aim to get a qualifying session underway Sunday morning before the Grand Prix. We have absolutely no idea what time that will be at the time of recording, so do keep across all the usual BBC Sports socials and the BBC Sport website and at We Could Be On 5 Live, We Could Be On 5 Sports Extra, We Could Be Anywhere. Just keep an eye out. Uh, right, we're all off for... Uh, a, a nice uh, water and we'll see you on Sunday.